us pray. Father, we just thank you so much for this glorious day. We thank you for our mothers, without whom we would not be here. Father, we thank you for your spirit, for the gift of your son, without whom we would not be here. We pray, Father, that you would be with us in this service. Let us remember your, your great promise to us, that your body and your blood given for us to sustain us and to strengthen us and to get us through each day. And as we thank you for our mothers, we thank you also for your spirit and pray that your presence be felt here, that we might grow and learn and go from this place better for having seen you and been with you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you would, please stand and let's say together the Apostles' Creed, what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
As you remain standing, we invite you to turn to those around you this morning, introduce yourselves, and greet them in the name of Christ. Well, I have missed you. Uh, I've been out for a couple weeks, and that is because my husband and I and Rick and Judy Hershey from this church took a cultural exchange cruise to Cuba. And so we went there to visit the Methodist Center and to visit uh, some churches, to meet with the people and so on. And so while we did not worship in one of those churches on Sunday, that doesn't stop them. We had special worship services throughout the week and sometimes we get in our little ruts here in this country and we think that it's just Birmingham or just the U.S. that is Christian or Methodist. It was so refreshing to walk into the Methodist Center in Cuba, which we had in our mind as a repressed country, and see the big flame and cross on the wall and to worship with them, to sing with them, and know that we are indeed part of a connectional system. The Methodist Church in the last seven years in Cuba has grown from 100 churches on the island to 400 churches on the island. We are sending from this church a mission team in July to help work on the seminary that is there to train more pastors to fill church slots. So many times when we talk about offering, we say, what programs do we have here? What is your giving support here at this church? But I wanted to remind you today, after this firsthand experience, that your giving also supports the work of the Methodist Church around the globe and makes it possible for congregations everywhere to worship the same God we do. I thank you and they thank you for your generosity. Ushers, please come. As the ushers are coming, apologies for showing up in worship today with a baseball cap on. It's the prettiest one I could find, and the bishop was wearing his hat, her hat, so that wasn't going to work. Had a little surgical procedure done, and this is much preferable to what you would see if the hat were off. So if you could just ignore it, I'd be grateful. <laughs> the choir is uh, going to sing an anthem that we have done a number of times. In remembrance of me, from Burl Red's larger cantata, Celebrate Life, which was really all the rage among youth choirs some years back, but it is perfectly appropriate as we gather round our Lord's table once more this morning.
be seated. As you're being seated, I invite you to take out your hymnals and turn to pages 13 and 14 for the great Thanksgiving today that um, Wes and Tyler will be leading for us. I want to remind you, I know we have several guests today, uh, people here with family members, and you do not have to be a member of this church to receive Holy Communion with us. You simply just need to have a heart that says yes to God and yes to Jesus Christ. And so if you're visiting with us, we do hope that you feel more than welcome to come and receive Holy Communion with us because it is certainly for everyone that is in this sanctuary right now. And we uh, appreciate you being here and uh, look forward to you coming to serve. Now, I'll also be coming out, and I'll mention that again in a moment. The offering that you may leave here at the altar rail will be going to a, a, a special cause called Fountain of Love. What is Fountain of Love is for older, adult, uh, older adults across our state who have special uh, financial needs uh, in their living situation and Fairhaven and our Methodist homes handle that. And so I look forward to your leaving an offering for that. At this time, uh, I believe Wes and Tyler will lead us. If you'll join me on page 13. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink of this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the prayer Jesus taught us when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. This time I invite our servers to come forward if they'll come as well as any communion stewards.
Praise be to God. You'll find the scripture lesson for today on page 27 in the New Testament section of your pew Bibles. The scripture lesson comes from Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. Hear now the word of God. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked a favor of him. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, declare that these two sons of mine will sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left, this is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the 10 heard it, they were angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So it was after many years of being online surfing the web that I learned about cookies. Those of you who, uh, who don't know what cookies are, I bet you do know, but you don't know exactly what they are. Uh, let, me, let me explain. So a cookie is something that when you are using the internet, a cookie is something that is written into the code of the website that allows some items to be placed on your computer so that perhaps next time that you go to that website, it recognizes a bit of who you are. So for instance, anytime that you go on and you sign up for something or you have to sign into a website, like you do that when you go on to your favorite movie watching website or to do online banking or to even check your email, you probably notice that even if you are not a super tech savvy person, that after you go a few times, it starts to recognize who you are. You may not have to always put your password in or your username or your account ID and that kind of thing. And so it stores that information, it tracks that information. And in its most useful sense, cookies are helpful for us. They help us save time, they cut corners for us. They, uh, the internet anticipates what we want and it helps us get to that. So that, however, begins to change when if what has happened to me has happened to you and you've been caught off guard about this. Have you ever found that you visited perhaps maybe a shopping website and found that when you go back to the site again, it suggests to you certain items that just happen to look identical to the things you previously searched for? Right? You know what I'm talking about. Well, this is all well and good. I mean, it feels a little bit uh, big brother-ish perhaps the first few times. I think we, we just grow accustomed to that quickly. Except not too long ago, uh, during the Christmas season, I remember my wife saying to me, so, looking at women's watches, were you? <laughs> and I said, what? You weren't supposed to see that? She said, well, I logged on to the internet and all these women's watches started popping up in the advertisements. And, I knew what you were doing, and I said, well, you're lucky it's for you. That's what I said. Uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, it, it feels a little bit intrusive. It feels a little bit creepy, but the internet and marketing and, uh, you know, people who are, who are trying to sell us goods and services, they're getting really good at this. Right? They're getting really savvy about this. I remember sort of the precursor to that happening with the internet. I remember uh, when I was in seminary, I served at a, as a student pastor at a church and interned there. And there was a guy at that church whose job it was who worked for one of these major uh, magazine publishing outfits. And he, would, he told me once that based on certain things that they can assume about you, like uh, things that your uh, perhaps zip code might tell about you or the likelihood that you would fit a certain profile, that the advertisements in your magazines would be tailored to you or at least someone who fits your profile. You probably noticed that too where you look through your magazine and you thought, oh, it's like they made this for me. They did. They did. So, so all of these things are, are starting to get there. And 
And it's interesting because we feel this tension in the, in the world around us as, as consumers. I mean, on the same week that we heard about some of the major airlines that are going to be actually moving the seats a little bit closer together and decreasing uh, leg room so that we can buy a few more inches and maybe add another row of seats. Another airline said, introducing uh, in 2017, we're going to have custom compartments where you can have your own little pod. Uh, now, I, I just guarantee you I will never pay that price that it costs to buy your own pod in an airplane. But, but on the one hand, uh, they're, they're, they're catering to one kind of consumer who says, rock bottom, just deliver me to the destination safely. I don't care how uncomfortable it is. And the other one who says, the experience matters greatly to me. And so they're trying to do a, a, a both and. We see this in the world around us, uh, especially as traditional retail models are, uh, are, are slinking away. We, we hear about major companies that we grew up with, like this week, um, Sears and Macy's and Penny's all having uh, economic struggles and, and earnings in the last quarter that were below uh, lowered expectations. And it, and it makes a difference to us. And so there's this desire, there's this, there's this commitment on the part of the retailer to try to give us exactly what we want. And as much as the experience can be tailored to us and make us feel known and wanted and, and understood, that's the goal. That's the goal of the retailer or the advertising company. And the funny thing is, is that over the last several decades, the churches have not been immune to this either. I mean, churches uh, have realized that it's not in their best interest to just say, here's who we are, take it or leave it, come or not. I mean, that's not, churches that have assumed that have not done well, right? And so churches begin to look around and they say, what do people want? What do people uh, expect? What do people need when they consider a church? And churches, I don't think in a healthy way always, have said, what is our neighbor doing? And what we sometimes mean by that is, what is our competitor doing, right? And so sometimes there's this feeling, oh, we have to compete for the same pool of people. And so it became very fashionable for a long time to have a, uh, a bookstore within your church or uh, a, a decade or two before that to have a family life center in your church. And uh, for a while there in the early uh, 2000s, hey, let's have a coffee house in our church. And so you have seen this, you have heard about this. There are some churches that actually have name brand fast food restaurants in their churches. The idea being, hey, we can give people all of the things that they want out there, but we can do it in here. And so it becomes something of an arms race for churches. Now, I don't think that the intentions behind this are necessarily a bad thing. Right? I remember uh, in seminary, one of my professors saying, you have to remember that the, certain, the, the world that the average parishioner in your congregation sees, they can't have a jolting kind of experience when they go into worship. At least many of them will be uncomfortable with that. So for instance, they say if they live in a world where they come into a building that has been well thought out, a lovely lobby, plenty of parking spaces, they can come in and they can access the kind of um, morning beverage that they want to when they come in the door and that's how their day starts and that's what they've become accustomed to and then you don't provide those kind of experiences at church, then there might be a disconnect. And so you need to think about that. But I think you see where this trend eventually takes us if we continue to play this out. You see, it feels like more and more there is a greater intensity around delivering to the consumer and the consumer gets to call the shots instead of a different kind of mindset. See, there is hardly a place left in this world <coughs> excuse me, or in our society where we don't approach things as consumers, right? Does this meet my needs? Will I get what I want from here? How is this going to feed me in, in a way that I need to be fed? And if it doesn't do that, then I'm on to the next thing. I'm on to the next one. I will look for somebody who can do it better, faster, cheaper, etc. The difference is is that what the church should be about 
is that it receives people who come into the church with a consumer mindset and it transforms them to servants. Think about that. Isn't that really a huge part about what the church is supposed to do? If you come into the church as a neophyte to Christianity and you die coming in at their die going out the same way that you came in which is what can the church do for me is this church meeting my needs am I getting everything I can out of this place then the church hasn't done its job the maturing of the Christian the Christian growth practice and growth cycle is one where you come in and you say, I want to belong, I want to be at a place that meets my needs, I want to have worship like it feels like home to me, I want to have programs that are there for my family and my kids, I want my whole family to feel happy and excited about coming to this place, and that's all good. And we want that for everyone, always. But at some point there needs to be that shift. We need to make that pivot, right, from coming from the consumer mindset into one of servanthood. The tricky thing is, is it's not like it's just a matter of taking the right amount of classes or through going through an orientation process or hearing the right amount of sermons or, or any of those kinds of things. It's something that not only has to be something that you come to terms with and decide that this is going to be a priority for you, but it also has to be something that is modeled for you. First of all, happy Mother's Day to all the moms this morning. Many of us, and I was thinking about this as I do every year on Mother's Day, because guess what, I go to church on Mother's Day every year, and on Mother's Day I always think, how many of you are like me and that you wouldn't be here today were it not a mother or a grandmother that really taught you your faith? Many of us are in that boat. Some of you had the dads who were, who were, who were very much sort of that, that spiritual leader or rock for you, and, and that's fantastic, not taking anything away from that. But I think, I would venture to guess that the more common story for many of us is that it was through our moms or our grandmothers or a woman in our family who did that. And many of us were also blessed to have female mentors in the church who are like mother figures for us. In Jim's uh, sermon at the 845 service, he talked about Miss Ruth, and many of you remember Miss Ruth and, and knew her and loved her, and she was that for you. Mine was a Miss Ruth too. Ruth Phelps, who was my associate pastor, led me through confirmation and was the first pastor who acknowledged my call to ministry, and I am incredibly and forever grateful to her. So you are here in all likelihood because somebody, and very, very likely that it was a woman, modeled that for you. And mothers do an incredible job modeling for us not a consumer attitude as the mom, but as a servant attitude as the mom. Our mothers give and they give and they give. And you know what? Most of the time, they wouldn't have it any other way. They're grateful for that opportunity. They're grateful to play that role of the servant because to serve and to show love is that greatest thing that mothers seek to do. And they can pass on their faith and they can pass on their values, they can pass on their teachings to all of us and it lives on in us. And that's the kind of servanthood that I think the church is calling us to be. It's not a resentful kind that says, okay, well, I guess I've been at this church for five years, so it's time to shift into servant mode. What do I got to do? No. It's a shift that happens over time where we say, this is about what it means to be a Christian. This is about what it means to be somebody who is mature in my faith, who has put down roots in this place. These are the kind of people and church members that weather the storms of the church through changes and difficulties and struggles and controversies and all of that stuff is overcome because we have taken on the, the viewpoint, the mindset, the mentality of a servant who says it has ceased to be about us and what we get out of this place, and it has become about what we put into this place and how we serve and how we care for and how we minister and how we pastor and how we show Christ to one another and to the world. If you want to know what that model looks like in a non-biblical way, it looks like mom. 
Now the mom in our scripture lesson this morning is the mom of James and John. And you've heard this expression, the helicopter parent, right? The one that just sort of hovers overhead <laughs> over the kids, right? You can't, you can't be that way. My son has a friend. He's got helicopter parents. It's like when they come over to drop the kid off, it's like, are you going to leave? We're like, we're good. We've got two of them on our own. We, we're, we can handle this. We can pick up a third. It's good. But, but James is, and John's mom, can you imagine? I mean, like, these guys are in their 20s, right? And their mom's like, hey, Jesus, a word? Um, <laughs> and so she says, look, my boys, I'd really like them on your right and left in heaven. So it's like she gets it. She's been teaching, she's picked up on the teachings, right? But she's still looking out for her boys. She's a mom after all, right? And James and John, then they go back to the rest of the disciples and they like, like, yeah, we know. Yeah, we know. <laughs> we know we're all in our 20s here. Mom is still looking out for us, putting in a word with Jesus. And they resent it. And Jesus says, look, it's not for me to decide, but it's, it's not that easy either. Can you drink from this cup that I drink from? Can you walk in my footsteps? Can you do these things? And James and John said, Lord, we can. And they're going to try, by gosh, and we're going to try too. But Jesus says, remember this. Being my disciple is not about what you get out of it. It's about taking on the form of a servant. It's about serving the other. It's about remembering our role and remembering our place. The first will be last. You must take on this role of a servant if you want to follow me. We just celebrated the Lord's Supper. And if you remember that story, it's again an instance of Jesus modeling what this looks like for us. First of all, he does this sort of low-key gesture of servanthood. He invites everybody in. He shows them this act of hospitality. He says, I'm going to have a meal for all of you. Will you come and be my guests? And so we have all come down to the rail to be his guests today. But then before they receive the meal, remember that Jesus unstrapped all of their sandals, and he knelt down and humbled himself in a scandalous way, knelt down before them, putting himself at foot level with each one of them, and he washed their gritty, dirty feet. And then after he did that, he shared a meal with them, but you remember what he said? He said, this is my body. This is my blood. And so he takes servanthood and he moves it from hospitality into lowering himself before them and then lowering himself as low as he can go and he says, I am giving my very life for you. That's the kind of servant that I am. That's what I represent for you. It's not what you are getting out of this. I am giving to you and to all of you for all time a gift. You need not keep coming in and consuming it. You have received it once for all time because of my grace and because of my glory. And now what I am hoping for you is that you will experience the transformation that leads to servanthood. And that servanthood is the part about not sitting at the right or the left or being concerned about our place in the pecking order or the line, but a shift in mentality that says the spiritual person, a mature Christian, is eager to be the servant. And we must move and make that pivot ourselves from consumer to servant for us to truly understand what it is that Christ calls us to. Now, I don't know exactly what that always is going to look like in each of your lives. Perhaps it's different for each one of us. And that's something that I would encourage you to pray about. But I know that we will each find that opportunity when we seek Christ's guidance and understand what it means to be obedient and to humble ourselves. And I leave you with these words from the letter to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. But he emptied himself, 
taking on the form of a servant, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Let us pray. God, as we look to our mothers and the mother-like figures for us who have taught us what it means to be a servant, either in their mothering or in the way that they lived out their faith, perhaps both. But we seek to not only take comfort in that, but inspiration and guidance that we might do the same. And Lord Jesus, help us to humble ourselves not just before you, but before one another, so that we too can serve before we are served. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.